Hello, everyone, and welcome to Marble City Opera's Behind the Scenes. I am Executive Artistic Director Catherine Frady for Marble City Opera. And we are so glad to have composer Frank Pesci with us here this evening. So, hi, Frank, how are you? Hi, I'm great, Catherine. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely. And you're joining us from Germany, yes? Yes, uh, I'm joining you from my home in Cologne, Germany, uh, where we've been for uh, about six years here in Cologne in Germany for almost eight. Wow. Is it, is it cold there today? No, you know what? Uh, spring is coming. Uh, the, uh, I actually saw the geese flying north today, so that was a good, a promising sign. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah. great. That's great. I think it is promising to warm up next week for us here too, so that's exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I just wanted to tell our audience a little bit that I actually met you, um, I think it was 2017 at the Fort Worth right. Opera Frontiers Festival. And the Frontiers right. Festival is, um, it's a festival for new works, right? And you were, you were mm -hmm. showcasing one of your other operas at that time. That's right. Um, I was there, it was 2017, about this time, maybe a little later in the spring. Um, I was there showcasing an Edgar Allan Poe opera that I had written, um, where I met you, uh, I met you there, you came to the show, and then I had also, we bumped into each other at the Opera America conference, which was happening in Dallas the same weekend. Yeah. So we, uh, we had a couple of run-ins. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just very impressed with your work. I remember, um, your Edgar Allan Poe opera just really spoke to me and my husband as well. And we really were right. impressed by your work. And so I knew Thanks. at that time, if I could find a reason to do one of your operas, uh, I'd love to. So, yeah. And here we are. And here we are. Um, <laughs> pandemic and everything, making it pandemic happen. Pandemic and everything, yes. <laughs> yes. And I, good for you guys for, for making these things happen to the the strength and resilience of of the companies that I've seen who have found ways to make things happen is, is really is really heartening. So right. good on you. Thank guys. you, thank you. It's a it's been a challenge, but I think it's one worth worth working through. You know, I agree. Um, and uh, while I really had some high hopes of performing this piece in kind of a speakeasy environment where the audience cool. got to like buy in um, chips and like have a whole poker night for everybody. You know, that's, mm, what, that's cool. that was my really, you know, hope for this piece. Um, obviously mm -hmm. we can't really have that kind of an intimate performance, um, but I think we've come up with another cool way to present it. So I'm excited. Um, Great. So let's, I'll just start asking you some questions. <laughs> do. I will try my best to answer them. <laughs> well, why don't you give us um, a little bit of background about yourself? I know you were born in DC and that you went to the University of Cincinnati. Um, mm -hmm. you've, sung, you've sung with um, Opera Cologne in Germany a little mm -hmm. bit um, and uh, artistic director for Boston Opera Collaborative at one point, mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. Yes, for about 25 minutes. That was. <laughs> That's right. It was a short but undistinguished tenure <laughs> as an associate artistic director. Yeah, I have. Uh, um, I am from DC. Uh, I grew up there also in the DC area. Um, I did go to school in Cincinnati. Uh, I did not go to the conservatory. That's a that's a long story in and of itself. But I actually found my way uh, through. To, to several different careers in music as an educator, as a as an administrator, which is what part of the, the that Boston Opera Collaborative gig was, uh, and as a professional choral singer um, up and down the Eastern Seaboard and through the Midwest for churches, uh, primarily in some concert work, um, with a couple of European tours, and then I um, and that continued when we moved to Germany. Um, in 2013, my wife is an opera singer, so I can't escape it. And uh, she um, she got hired in the resident ensemble at a, ha a house in Karlsruhe, which is in southwest Germany. And then two years later, she got picked up by um, the Cologne Opera, which is where we've been ever since. So there, both in Karlsruhe and here, I was I was singing with um, uh, with the chorus in. Um, 
many performances. I think I did almost a hundred performances in Karlsruhe and, and then, uh, you know, an additional uh, good hunk here in the last couple of years. Um, so it, it's been a, it, this is all in addition to my work as a composer as well over the last 20 years or so, starting off through choral music and then working my way towards, towards where I am now, which is primarily writing opera. Very cool. That's so exciting. Um, what was your first composition? Um, I guess, I mean, I know you have many comp compositions, so maybe tell us what your very first composition was and where it was premiered and um, your first opera. Um, well, first composition depends on how far back you want to go. <laughs> uh, because I remember as a kid, you know, fourth, fifth grade, writing little rhymes or parodies of pop songs and things like that. Um, and that's been going on for a while. Get into high school, I started playing guitar and was in a couple of bands, so I was writing for them. Um, and then probably at, when I got out of high school is when I started writing notation-wise, right? For things that I knew, so I wrote a couple of saxophone quartets, and I wrote a wind ensemble piece. I wrote a wind ensemble piece out of high school, which was then read by my high school wind ensemble, because that's when I learned the horror of instrument transposition, <laughs> um, uh, and and the, the embarrassment of that <laughs> with bass clarinetists looking at you blankly because they don't play in bass clef. So that so so there was that. Um, and then, you know, there was sort of a back and forth between writing legit and writing um, sort of jazz pop singer songwriter stuff for a while. Um, as my composition career has developed to this point, which really started once I left school, um, uh, my first composition in that period would have been a choral work at the beginning of, of about a decade of writing choral music. And that was something that I worked on with my teacher at University of Southern Mississippi. Um, and it was premiered there uh, by the chorale at Southern Miss. Um, and then there have been, since then, it was then a long line of, of, uh, of different types of styles of, of writing and, and pieces and, and uh, uh, instrumentations and things like that, that, that got me to opera. Um, yeah, it, it, it's been, uh, there have been, so it's, it's kind of hard to say when's my first composition, but it's been a string of, of writing that started when I was a kid and then just took many forms depending upon which medium I was Writing working in at the time. Yeah, 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 that's pretty amazing. But it was always yeah. it was always in you to create music. That's really cool. Yeah, we had a real creative house, um, and that kind of thing was absolutely encouraged. Um, in addition to you know, there's a lot of people in my family, and you know, we all talk really fast, and and we all play a lot of word games, and and you know funny rhymes and you know we're back there's a lot of back and forth so that kind of verbal improvisation um, was something that I learned to do pretty early and that sort of started me out writing some songs for myself and, and putting words together and that kind of thing so oh, that's it cool. was really yeah it was it was it was a good place to grow up uh, in terms of my artistic development that's awesome yeah. I have a lot I have a lot to owe to my to my family for that that's amazing. That's really great. Uh, so good to hear. Uh, so what inspires you about composing opera? Um, well, like I said, with, um, you know, in my family being encouraged to participate in creative endeavors that also included um, performing on the stage. And everybody, I think, everybody in my family performed in plays or musicals wow. at some point. Um, even my father, my mother did not. She was, she was definitely a supporter, but she, she preferred the support from the, uh, from the audience. So I started doing shows on the stage from second grade. Wow. Uh, and, um, and I had always been drawn to uh, dramatic performing arts. 
Um, I worked for a long time with my sister. She and I talked together uh, for a decade doing um, musical theater summer programs for teens in the DC area. Um, I music directed a lot of shows coming up um, and was always drawn to that kind of presentation. So that when I finished school and I was like, okay, so what do I want to do with, um, with my writing? Opera was always the end goal. The other thing is that it was one of the, it was really one of the pillars of my musical like understanding growing up in, uh, growing up in this house with my father playing music all the time. He either played big band jazz or he played Puccini. Oh, wow. So that, so that became like, you know, it was like Woody Herman or, you know, he's sitting in the chair weeping at the end of the fourth act of Bohem on the, on the Met broadcast, you know? So that was, that was what I had in my ears all the time. So um, it just operates sort of a no brainer goal for me. And it always has been. Yeah, that's so cool. That's amazing. And so do you say that those, like you were listening to big bands and Puccini a lot. Do you, do you think that that music really inspired you or do you have another musical inspiration that helped you write your operas? Um, I don't know if that kind of music was serves as an inspiration in the general understanding of it, but it is certainly the way I hear what I want to write. Um, in the last, the, the, the biggest struggle of my compositional endeavors has been trying to put those two together. Um, my jazz sensibilities and my, my legit sensibilities and also specifically my opera understanding. Um, and it was, um, it was a real struggle to try to put the two together and to try to find a place where putting the two together would be supported because those two camps can really be at odds. Right. Uh, depending upon which one you talk to, the other one is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what I wound up doing is actually within the last five or six years and Royal Flush is, is a good example of it is when I committed to finding my own third stream, if you know Gunter Schuller and, and that sort of combination of classical and jazz that he called third stream, is finding one for myself that isn't, isn't necessarily one or the other. It's not like opera singers singing jazz or it's not, you know, opera singers singing how they would normally with a, with a hi-hat in the background. It is, it is a a gathering together of all the parts of my understanding into something new. And um, that has been incredibly inspiring for me to get to the point where I can hear the things that I hear, not be critical that it's to one side or the other, and then see how it comes out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, That's and amazing. that is inspiring. Yeah, that is inspiring to me that, that I've been able to work and find solutions to express the, the things that I hear. Yeah, and creating your own voice in that way. It's a really unique yeah, way it, of, of com composing, yeah. Yeah, it is, a, it is something I've been working very hard on and, um, and I'm really, I'm, I'm happy with how it's been turning out over the last, the pieces that I've written in the last four, five, six years or so. Yeah, Royal That's Flash exciting. One of them. That's yeah. exciting. Yeah, um, I love Royal Flush. I think it's fantastic. Um, Thank you. So I'm really excited about sharing it with our audience. Does your wife you. being being an opera singer, does she sing some of the the music when you're composing it? She has been um she's been the voice that I've written for all of the time when I'm writing when I've been writing art songs. Um most of my experience in understanding art song was through listening to her and hearing her recitals. Um so I got a, a, a excellent education in that. Um, when it comes to the operatic writing, um, we've actually, she's actually my touchstone when it comes to dramaturgy and, um, and dealing with how voices in general work in particular musical contexts. 
um, as opposed to, you know, here, darling, sing this for me. It's, it's much more <laughs> of a, I, I have, which, which has its own ups and downs um, because, <laughs> because I know that I can get a, um, a very clear response of of what I'm asking for her to listen to. So, and also it's become incredibly helpful for me because she is, she's she got a, a really uh, sharp eye for dramaturgical things and, and continuity and that kind of stuff, which- Oh, that's uh, great. Yeah, which was extraordinarily helpful. Couldn't do without her. That's awesome, that's awesome. If she's listening in the next room, I couldn't do without <laughs> I couldn't do it without you. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling being married to a stage director. <laughs> yes, you do. I, I believe, I'm sure you do. <laughs> but it's nice she to She couldn't have... do it without you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's nice to have that, you know, person, you know, in the house who you really trust, who you can bounce ideas mm -hmm. off of and who are going to be honest with you. And I think, you know, it's a, it's a great thing. Right. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So how do you determine, you know, we're talking about Royal Flush, like how do you determine the subjects? And, and I think you write mm -hmm. a lot of the libretto for your own works and you did for this one. Um, how, do you, how do you come up with the, the subject for your operas? Um, that's a great question. And um, the operas that I, Royal Flush was my fourth opera. And um, well, I think you would ask me that before it was my first opera. The Poe opera was my first opera. Um, and there have been two other one acts in between that and Royal Flush, which is the fourth one, and I'm working on the fifth one now. So subject matter is, um, it starts very small, really. Um, it starts as uh, a seed, right? And then that seed then has to be put into context, and then it just kind of goes. Sometimes, for example, of the Poe opera, the seed was, um, I needed to write something very quick on a very specific theme um, for a show that my friend was, was, was putting together. Um, and in this one for Royal Flush, it was, um, there were two seeds. I had, I had um, made calls to opera companies around 2015 to introduce myself and, um, try to start getting my name around a little bit more. And I prompted this introduction with a conversation about the types of things that opera companies would have to have in place before they would consider commissioning a new piece. Um, and the two, two of the biggest themes that came out of that when I, I spoke to these companies was comedy and more roles for women. <laughs> yes. And... <laughs> That was very loud and very clear. Um, so I took those two seeds, comedy and more roles for women. I went to my teacher at the time, uh, who's a fabulous opera composer named Darren Hagen. And um, he said, okay. And he, he gifted me the idea. He's like, it's like hand to bridge, but do a hand to poker. Uh, everybody has an aria where they reveal their tell and the, the dealer picks up on all of it and uses it against them and takes all their money. There you go. <laughs> There's your show. So, so I had my concept and I had my premise and then I had just had to take the next three and a half years to figure out who these people were and what their relationships do, were to each other. Um, the part about writing my, the libretti, uh, in the previous one, the previous three operas, I had, I had adapted libretti from already existing sources. So like the Poe opera, I took from his story and I took from his poetry and fashion to libretto along those lines. Um, for this one, I just wanted to give it a try to see yeah. what it was like to write my libretto in addition to writing all the music. Um, and in some ways I really enjoyed it. And in other ways it was, it showed a lot more um, a lot more holes than I was prepared for. So there was a lot of work that I had to do to learn about dramaturgical timing and um, the continuity of relationships between, you know, across the entire show and um, 
how to lay out the major points in a, a particular structure so that when we got to the big reveal that it had all been laid out so well. So it was, it was a huge learning experience to do that. Um, I may or may not do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I may, I'm the, the piece I'm working on now, I'm working with the librettos. So, um, so we'll see. I mean, it's, it's just, it sort of was a, uh, let's give it a try and see what happens. Yeah, well, I think, you know, yeah. having the experience that you said growing up where your family was, you know, very verbal and, mm -hmm. and uh, using all that language, it, it surely mm -hmm. helped, you know, when you, when you sat down to, to write the libretto. Yes, it did. It did. I was able yeah. to draw on all those skills. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your process? Do you, did you write the libretto first and then go to the, the composition like you would if you were getting a libretto from a librettist? Or? Um, yes, but even before that was um, the treatment. Uh, so I have the, the concept, I have the, the situation, then I have to have a, um, I have to have a roadmap of what happens in what order. And it was fairly easy because I could structure it in the course of um, a hand of poker. Uh, and, you know, cause there are points when bets are made and cards are dealt and things like that. And that gave me an opportunity to structure things out. Um, and then start filling in the details. So it was like, um, you know, so again, from the smallest seeds, it started to grow into this thing. And then even when I got into the writing of it um, and writing the text, which in some cases I wrote whole sections of text before I set them. And in some cases I had sort of an idea of the text. And then when I'm writing, new text comes to me as I'm writing. So I incorporate that into it. It was much this was one of the surprises. It was much less of a um, strictly structured endeavor than I anticipated it being, um, which also I was. It, it kind of worked with the way that I was I was writing because I was I was really incorporating my jazz background and some of these things and and uh, all of the stuff was sort of was was happening at the same time. So and then some of the rhythms or a particular motive would come through it, and that would spark a different word association that I hadn't written down before, but I said, screw it and let's put that in and see where it goes. So it was, it was um, in a lot of ways, it was a really big improvisation um, to come out with, uh, to come out with what I did. Um, yeah, I wish, I wish I could say it was so much more structured if I had this plan and it was so organized, but it wasn't. It was, let's throw something against the wall and see if it sticks. Well, I and, love that. I think yeah, that sounds yeah. really cool. It seems like it was like a very organic process a little bit in that way, you yeah. know, where you're just, you're, you're being inspired and you're writing and you have the concept and it's like coming to you. And I, I think that sounds really amazing. That's really, it's really cool. Yes. Yeah. Organic is, is the word I was looking for because <laughs> that was, <laughs> because that was, that was what it turned out to be. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, so who are the characters in Royal Flush? Um, well, you have four, uh, you have four players and a dealer. Um, as I described in the score, the four players are sisters, either by blood or common experience. And the dealer is a mother figure for all of them. There's also a father figure who is deceased, but his influence is felt throughout the show. So um, I decided to leave it there um, as, so that, you know, the complexities of casting and, and whatever directors are going to want to do has an opportunity to flourish just within a very a broad scope. These women know each other very well. They've known each other since their childhood. Whether they're actually related or not is kind of irrelevant. Um, so with that kind of sibling uh, relationship, there is this commingling of love and competitiveness that is inherent amongst, uh, uh, amongst siblings, sisters in particular, um, that then shows itself in the way that they relate to each other um, and how they, 
interact with and exploit the un, the hidden vulnerabilities that inadvertently come out through something that they say or in an experience like this where they're playing poker really badly and they all have <laughs> these they all have these tells that are associated very closely with the personality that everybody already knows so the, the in the grand scheme of it it is uh exposing your vulnerabilities to people who already know them and in doing so actually finding safety and acceptance. Oh, well, that's nice. Um, yes. And of course, the mother figure knows their tells she already. She knows them all. Yeah. So, that, so that's why she's like, we, can, we don't even have to do the show. We can just go to the end because I already know <laughs> you're all bluffing. Because I'm, I'm going, going to, to take all your yeah. money. <laughs> and I'm going to take all your money. Um, so the, the characters themselves are not the only character who is this very specific person is the dealer. The dealer is very much my mother. Um, in addition to my mother, I also have four sisters, three of whom are still living. And uh, in case they are watching this, none of these characters are them. <laughs> um, love you all. Um, but there are so many strong female personalities in my family. Um, going from my wife and my daughter all the way up through my sisters and my mother. And then uh, my grandmothers were very strong personalities. And I had all these aunts and great aunts who are also this like cloud of matriarchy around my, my childhood. So, and all of them I draw a little bit from um, in terms of putting these characters together. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's sort of a good like behind the scenes as what we're talking about here, behind the scenes understanding of who these characters are. Um, you don't have to get too deep into them. You can just see that these are four characters plus a, a fifth one who, uh, who know each other very well and are having a pretty good time really playing bad poker with each yeah, other. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and the characters, they're very clear. You know, I think mm. you be, based off their tell, you know, they become, mm -hmm very three-dimensional very quickly and so mm -hmm. they're very relatable in that way I think Good. Um, Good. and I think it's fun to find how different they are and kind of expose um, how different they are but with that common thread through the mother character you know so mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. of the things I'm exploring with is um, costuming them you know really based off of their personality that comes out in their tell mm -hmm but having the mm -hmm. mother character kind of have um, a style that embodies all, all of the other characters as well. Cool. So that it's like cool. clear, clear that they're connected. So Very that cool. she understands each of them. So. Excellent, yeah, that's great. That's, that's they're great. fun. Yeah. So, but you have the pianist actually speak or have a speaking role in here. Who's the pianist in this story? Uh, you know, the pianist is nobody in particular. This the, the little bit of speaking that the pianist does was a um, it, it was a it was a solution. I don't know if it was the most elegant solution, but it was a solution to make it work if there's no conductor. Um, so that which is pianist, perfect for us. <laughs> OK, right. So that rather than having because the, the show is designed so that all you need it's five singers, a pianist, and a card table, and you could do it anywhere. And if there's also like a conductor standing in front of them, I thought to myself, that might be a little weird, unless the conductor is able to conduct from the piano. And then what is a piano player doing in the middle of this poker game? Unless you go like straight wild west, and it's the guy in the corner, uh, <laughs> you know, playing, uh, you know, stride piano the whole night. That's out of tune, which would be really cool. But that's another, I mean, that's a directorial thing. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so I just gave the pianist a little bit to sort of explain what they might be doing there. And also for a gag, you know, for the gag later on in the show. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess he could be the yeah, dad. The, it could, it could. Um, or it could be a boyfriend or it could be the brother that everybody ignores because that's just true. They got too much space. <laughs> which is not saying that which is not saying that didn't that, happen to you you know that didn't happen no, to you. <laughs> no, no. oh no i was i was the baby i was adored <laughs> and i hope they're watching this um 
yeah, no. So it, it was really a means to an end. And of course the pianist could be female as well. Absolutely. So, um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's, um, could be another sister, an aunt. It could be an aunt yeah. or. It's, know, it's, there's, there's it's so like, it's problems. the sister who, you know, is kind of in cahoots with, with the mom and yeah. knows all of their tells so well, you yeah. know. <laughs> Mom's favorite. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's it's very fun to have that little addition. Um, so I think, and it you know for us it works really really well because we do, you know, a piece with just piano. You know, like you mentioned, and five singers. You don't necessarily need a conductor for. I mean, right. we we miss you conductors, but we all and we always need you, but <laughs> but we don't necessarily need you. And um, <laughs> so <laughs> no, it kind of it works really well. Um, you know, and especially in intimate settings yep. and things like that. So yeah, that was the that was the hope. Um, you know, I try to have some flexibility when it comes to these shows uh, that I write, so that they could be done in a number of different settings and a number of different um, instrumental configurations, if, if necessary. Um, because I was an administrator, and I understand the um, I understand the budgetary considerations that most companies work under. And, you know, and even just in my short time working with Boston Opera Collaborative, that was a major consideration of what can we do? So that informs the way that I present my pieces in terms of, um, you know, I'm completely flexible in working with companies to make the show happen um, under any given circumstances. This is sort of a, a, a sort of a magnification of that, which is this is a small show that can be done at universities with professional ensembles uh, in intimate rooms in somebody's living room. I mean, it could be done anywhere. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's really versatile. Um, I, I think I think versatile composition is really where, where it's at um, yeah. these days, yeah. you know. And I think that even the the larger companies um, are going to be finding that they want pieces that are versatile, you know, during this time, especially like during the pandemic, and they can't perform bigger things. And so mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's a really great option to have to have options within the composition itself, you know. So yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Awesome. So, how important are your staging notes in your score? <laughs> Like oh, how true? Well. How true do you want them to be? Like in your in your ideal world, does the director go exactly with what you have on the page? Um, no, because also I know that will never happen. Um, but uh, the few stage directions that I do put in, um, I mean, yeah. Um, if only to give a very clear picture of what I had in mind to start a particular scene. Um, or uh, if it relates musically to something that's happening. Um, I want to like a, a particularly um, jarring chord that needs to happen on someone's entrance, that kind of thing. So right. I will, that's when I will make, look, this is, this is something that has to line up musically. Um, that's when I try to be specific. The rest of it, I'm kind of like, you know, I know directors are gonna direct <laughs> and, uh, and that's totally fine. That's what they need to do. So, you know, um, that's sort of a, a answer, non-answer. <laughs> yeah no I mean well it's interesting because I think you know it's um you know when you're especially when you're premiering a work you want it to be you want it to be close as close as possible to what the composer is really intended um mm -hmm. but I think you know when you add that that's the stage director in and, and their creative process and their you know interpretation of the piece as well uh, if you can collaborate um to come up with something you know and, and have conversations that sometimes yeah. the the director can bring that dramaturgical side to it that maybe mm -hmm. even a composer didn't think of so 
I think there's like, it's, the, it's a balance, you know, um, but I definitely Absolutely. think that it's important to stay true to the composer and what they were thinking and, and try to help and try to help the piece elevate, you know, mm -hmm. any piece mm -hmm. of music, I think, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's the goal, right? When we put it on stage. Yeah, so. it, it is. I mean, and that, that is the, the essence of the collaborative nature of writing pieces like this is that um, not only should a composer be able to hand it off to a production team and trust that they are going to um, not only faithfully interpret what you have, but also find things that because you've been looking at the damn thing for so long, you, you, you miss completely, but someone can shine a different light on it and then a whole new level of meaning can come out. That's the, the benefit of, of that kind of collaborative effort. So. Yeah, it's exciting. I wish you were going to be here in town so we could do more of that, but we'll have to have some Zoom meetings. <laughs> we'll have some Zoom meetings. We'll have, have whatever we can do. Whatever we can do. I'll stay up late if I have to. <laughs> it's like three in the morning there. <laughs> Coming into our not, not very responsive, but I will be there. I will be present. <laughs> oh, goodness. Mm. That's amazing. So, I think we've kind of answered some of these others um, questions that I had for you um, okay. because we talked about one of my questions was, do you compose with large stage or venue in mind um, mm. in general? Mm -hmm. Do you have a extension of what you've said already about that or? Uh, well, sometimes uh, it depends upon the parameters of the commissioner. If there's a specific number of instruments that need to be written for. Um, you're kind of locked into that, but when it comes to when it comes to big pieces like this with lots of moving parts, I have developed um, uh, I have developed a way of presenting things automatically with multiple casting and instrumentation options, um, simply because I understand that you have to be flexible if you want the piece to be done, and I in total agreement with what you said before, I, I do not um, view opera as a, um, a, as only a grand concept, um, that there can be operatic expressions in, um, in so many different configurations, both large and small. Um, and even within the, the framework of the same the same subject, the same piece. Um, it can be done in so many different ways and one cannot simply be rigid and say, this is the piece and this is how it has to be done. That just doesn't, that never made any sense to me. <laughs> um, and maybe, maybe it's a, a jazz thing because, you know, you can play a tune with a full, uh, a full big band or you can play it with a three piece ensemble and it's still the same piece, but it has just a different, a different shading. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Well, I, I love that. I mean, I think I'm always trying to break all of the rules. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. so I, I just, you know, I don't like being put in a box and mm -hmm. feeling like, you know, these are the only ways that anything can happen. I feel like there's mm -hmm. many ways for, you know, presentations of, of opera. And so I, I love that answer. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, what is, okay, so do you have a scariest moment of an opera premiere? Uh, they're all terrifying. Um, <laughs> the worst, the worst part about it is uh, sitting in the audience and listening um, and hearing absolutely everything and then still having to get up and bow at the end. Um, Regardless of whether or not it was, it, it's brilliant, the performance is brilliant or not. And I have been blessed with some really pr brilliant performances of things that I have written. I have, I have not had too many clunkers, which is great. Yeah. Um, but that's part of it is that you, you have to um, allow for catastrophic failure to happen during the rehearsal process. 
<laughs> so that it doesn't it's entering the collaborative process. You have to allow, allow for total humiliation because that is the only way it's going to get better. And my ultimate goal at the end of the day is to be a better opera composer. And I have found that the only way is to, to, to become a better opera composer is to learn from the mistakes that I make it so that I can make new mistakes later on. <laughs> so what is going to happen is um, you guys are going to do the show and I will um, be as available to you as I can. Um, but I'm going to trust because I know your work and I know that it's good that I'm going to trust that you guys are going to do the best show that you can do. And I will have to listen to it and learn what I can and respect every single process of it. And that in and of itself for me is difficult. Saying that sentence for me was incredibly difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is a relinquishing of, of control that has to happen. Yeah. At some point in time, you, you got you to gotta just hand the score over because there's not much more you can do with it, yeah. even though you want to. Yeah. I'm sure it feels um, very vulnerable. It is. It really is, you know? Yeah. And it's, um, uh, but that's the point. Yep, exactly. I mean, what am I, what else am I doing this for? Exactly. Uh, if not to, uh, you know, nothing so dramatic as burying my soul or anything like that. But I mean, I am putting something in front of other people mm -hmm. that is, and in this case, even more so that is intended to make them laugh. And that is a vulnerable experience. And uh, it is not any better because I am not physically present. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I so, think actually, I guess, yeah. yeah, I, I know what you mean because I think some, in some ways not being physically present with your audience is even harder sometimes. I've, I've found yeah. through the pandemic, you know, performing, um, you know, through these means um, online, you don't get mm -hmm. immediate feedback. You don't have an audience mm -hmm. there to respond to you. And, and it mm -hmm. does, it feels even more vulnerable than normal, you know, because mm -hmm. you don't have that feedback. Um, yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a delay. There's a delay. There's a yeah. 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 So, but it is, um, it's why, it's why we do it. And I think, the more vulnerable we can be as artists, the more likely we are to touch other people's lives. And that is the point of what we're doing. So yeah. it is, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. but it is scary. So <laughs> it is scary. So I don't know if that answered your question or if it answered it your question too much, uh, which is also possible. <laughs> so. Well, you're, you're just really vulnerable. And so now you're gonna have to have the fear after it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Did she understand what I meant? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, so do you have, is there a specific idea that you would love the audience to walk away from on that note? Like after watching Royal Flush? Hmm. Um, you know, the way it ends, and we're not gonna give it away here, but the way it ends, if it if it is successful, then I would expect the audience's reaction to be like, "Oh yeah," and that's basically it. If if they laugh at the jokes, that would be great. If they are moved by some of the more moving moments of it, that would be great too. But the purpose of a comedy is to get to the end of it and go, "Ha, huh, okay." And that's, you know, like, this was a good experience. Yeah. And that really is all I'm going for. Yeah. Um, that they have a good experience at the theater. And it doesn't have to be heart-wrenching. And it doesn't have to be, you know, catastrophic and miserable and make you sad the rest of the evening. That you can get through the end of the show and have a few laughs and dare, I say, be entertained. <laughs> but there is a there is a that's a major part of it yeah that hopefully and especially the people who are going to be watching now just like everybody else is going through hell and um some people's are worse than others i understand but still 
it might be okay to just sit and watch a show that is fun to watch with enjoyable music and have a kind of a nice message that you that is simple enough that you can bring home with you yeah yeah no that's so, great that's what i'm bring, that's what i'm bring, for. bring a little joy to everyone bring a little joy just <laughs> just a, a little smidge. yeah just a little bit <laughs> That's great. So where can our audience find out more about you and your and your work? Uh, they can go to my website, which is frankpesci.com. Um, and I am one of those composers who likes to put everything out there. So you can actually peruse most of my material, um, scores and at least MP3 recordings uh, of everything. Um, I do have a lot of recordings of songs and my choral music through my publisher uh, is available. So um, all of that is there. You can, you can tool around and see what's been going on. That's wonderful. That's, and we'll the, put, that's the best way to do it. Yeah, that's wonderful. We'll put, we'll put the, uh, your website in the, in the link um, below the video. So thank you so much everyone for joining us um, with this great talk with Frank Pesci, composer of Royal Flush. Um, Stay tuned for more events on YouTube as we lead up to this performance and the premiere on March 11th, 12th, and 13th. On February 25th, we'll be doing a behind the scenes text reading of the opera. And on March 4th, there'll be a little sneak preview with a little bit of the music. And then join us at the Tennessee Amphitheater or online on March 11th and 12th at 7.30 p.m. or on the 13th at 2.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next week.